Today, uh, we're going to talk about the resurrection today. But we're going to talk about it in a way that maybe you haven't thought about. The funny thing that we all have in common here today is we all have some type of expectation. It's one thing that, that, that we all have in common is that we all have certain expectations. Now, some of you may say, uh, things haven't met my expectations or my life hasn't lived up to what I thought it was going to be or, or, or however you want to frame it. But nonetheless, we wake up in the morning with some type of expectation, good or bad. We all have an expectation of how the day's going to turn out, about how my life's going to turn out, the next two, two minutes, the next two hours, the next two years. We all live with expectations. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So we're going to go to one of the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to read from chapter 24. And if you're new here, we do this little thing where we stand in honor of God's Word. And so could you do that with me, please? We'll read chapter 24, verse 1 through 8. And this will be the last time you have to stand up until the end. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 8. You can see it on the screen. You can um, find it in the Bible app, or you can find the Hope Community Church app, or some of you brought a paper Bible with you. That's awesome. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Say amen if you're ready. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men dressed in their best Easter clothes. You thought you were the first one to dress up for Easter. Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Father, we thank you today, especially today. We have hope today because Jesus resurrected. Because the very thing we fear the most, death, lost its grip on humanity. Jesus overcame death to give us life. We thank you for that. Lord, we know that your word has the power to renew our minds, to change the way we think. So we came together in your presence to have that happen. Change us today. Speak directly to us. Thank you for this. In Christ's name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. If you read the four gospel accounts, you get a a very detailed picture of what happened the morning of the crucifixion. Luke records that before daylight, before the sun came up, there's a group of women, including Mary Magdalene, who, who had prepared spices to take to the tomb and, and put them on Jesus's body. Now, the tomb was, if you've seen pictures of tombs in Jerusalem, the tomb would have been a hole hewn out of a rock. And, and it was common to have what would look like a, a stone, a round stone wheel in front of it. And, and it would ride in like a trough. And what they would do is they would roll the stone back when they would put spices on the body and then roll it back closed. And even later, after the body had totally decomposed, they would roll the stone back and they would typically put the body in a stone, put the bones in a stone box. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament and Joseph, after Joseph had died, they had his bones in a box. And so this, 
This wouldn't have been a permanent thing like what we do now where we bury somebody, never bring them up again. They would have had the ability to roll this stone back and forth, back and forth. And so the women go there that morning with the idea that they're going to find somebody to roll a stone back so that they can put spices on a dead body. They get there probably still pretty dark. They get there and they see the stone has already been moved. So this whole scenario is starting to not make sense now. Why would the stone already be moved? There was nobody else that was going to care for him. Like they were, they were the ladies that were going to care for the dead body of Jesus. They, there, there wasn't anybody else on the schedule to volunteer that week. So now it's becoming confusing. The stone is rolled away. And now the question of who would roll the stone away became who did roll the stone away. They, they lean into the tomb to find out there's no body there. Luke records them being perplexed. I think that's a polite way of being absolutely shocked and dumbfounded. That after all, why would somebody come in the middle of the night? Why would somebody roll the stone back? Why would somebody, why would this happen? And then in the middle of that confusion, Two men who I think it's safe to say were angels. It wasn't like glitter on them. It wasn't sequins. They weren't, they weren't wearing a Broadway show jacket. I believe that they were shining with the residual power that had raised Christ from the dead. That there was such a power the other gospel writer said there was an earthquake that happened. There was the, the, that there was a supernatural thing that took place and Jesus rose from the dead. And now there's two angels sitting in that tomb going, what y'all looking for? <laughs> the angels say something to the ladies that, I'll be honest with you, on face value seems kind of abrupt. There wasn't a hug taking place. There wasn't, hey, we know you came looking for Jesus. We just want to explain. We, we know that you had some expectations, but we want to make sure. No, they look at them. They look at the ladies and they say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? To me, that seems a bit abrupt. To me, that seems more confusing it's just adding confusion to the whole scenario. We show up at night, we show up in the, in the, in the, in the pre-dawn light and, and, and there's a stone already rolled away, Jesus' body, and now there's two guys glowing in the tomb. And, and now you're telling me, why are we looking for the living among the dead? I'm just not, it's just, it just seems to be adding to the confusion. And they would go on to have a conversation, to explain some things. I wanna to talk to you this morning about your expectations. It's one thing we do all have in common. When you wake up in the morning, you have, you have kind of set your mind to an expectation of how things are going to happen. Amen. How many of you, your expect, it, it, the morning went exactly like you expected it this morning already. Can we raise your hand? Oh, you guys are just life wizards. You're like, you're like, Psh, I woke up this morning. I already had to chart it out. It's working. It's working. How many of you woke up this morning uh, and your children just screwed the whole thing up? Anybody? <laughs> Some of you are like, they're sitting right here, man. They're, they're just taking them with you. How many of you woke up this morning and your spouse screwed the whole thing up? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. You're just like, what is going? We're going to church. It's Easter. Wake up. If we took that concept farther, the truth of the matter is we've all had unmet expectations, haven't we? At some point in time of our lives. Maybe you had an expectation of what marriage looks like. And then you got married. <laughs> Maybe you had an expectation of what kids were going to be like. And then you had kids. Maybe you had an expectation about what your first job or your first love. Maybe you had an expectation about, about your, your first career, you're like, man, I'm graduating college and this is, I'm going to crush it. 
and you've gotten into your first job and you hate it. The truth of the matter is we all have that commonality between us, the, the whole expectation thing. And, and the, the truth of the matter is we all know what it feels like to have unmet expectations or missed expectations. But there's a, there's a thing that happens to us with expectations that, um, that we need to be careful about. There's a little phrase called recency bias. Anybody ever heard of that? Recency bias, they, they talk about it in investing and things like that. It's how the latest thing that happened affects the next thing that's gonna happen, your next choice. The latest thing that happens, the most recent thing that happens calls you to be biased because of that thing happening. So that thing happens and now you're biased towards the next thing that's gonna happen. Everybody following me? Recency bias is not historical bias, it's recency bias. So maybe if you were historically biased, you'd be smart enough to look about the whole trajectory of history and say, hey, let, like, I don't have anything to be worried about because plenty of people have lived together that hated each other's guts. I don't have anything to worry about, right? No, no, no. But because it's so recent, we say, this can never happen. There's no hope. And I want to make a case to you that the that the ladies that morning and the disciples were suffering from recency bias. You have to remember they've, they've given three, at least three years of their lives, maybe a little, they had, they had quit jobs. They had, they had neglected. You could, you could probably make the case that they had not stayed with their family. Some of them, and they'd followed Jesus and they had given everything. There was a conversation between the disciples and Jesus at one time, like, Hey, what about us? We've given up everything. Their whole future, their whole expectation was wrapped up in the idea that Jesus was the man. They'd watched him heal. They'd watched him deliver. They watched him cast demons out. They watched him raise Lazarus from the dead with just a word come forth. They'd watched all that. They'd even watched him give them power. He sent them out. The first, he sent 12 of them out and they cast out demons and healed the sick. And then he sent 72 of them out and, and, and they did miraculous things. They came back and testified. Man, demons trembled in our presence. Could you imagine what a ride that would have been? Man, Jesus, we're with Jesus, man. Back up. Hey, what are you doing in the future? What's your plans look like? Jesus, I'm with Jesus. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing. Yeah. What? <laughs> Massive amounts of expectation. You could hear it in their conversations with Jesus. Like, hey man, we're gonna do this? And then the cross happens talked about it last week. Then they watched that same Jesus who seemingly could slip through the Jewish rulers. Like, like he could slip through there. There'd be groups of people that would try to, that would try to take him captive and they, and they couldn't, he would, he could disappear. He could walk on water. He could, he could, when, 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 when a crowd would gather around him to try to make him King, he could slip out and then they'd find him walking on the water. Like it was crazy. And yet all of a sudden he's tried without any defense. He doesn't, he doesn't take up for himself. He doesn't, he doesn't make a case. He doesn't say, Hey, I'm bringing Peter, James and John in here. They'll tell you what I was doing. He makes no effort to even defend himself. They watch him go to the cross and they watch him die. And along with the dead body of Jesus went their expectations down the tube. And we could tell because the women don't show up with lanterns and party balloons. They show up with burial spices. Because, because your, your recency bias, what the last bad thing that happened to you tends to, tends to turn you in the future. It, it, it tends to set the expectation for the next thing. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it, maybe you've said this. I, I, I've probably said this. Well, well, ain't nothing good going to happen now. 
Now that this happened, nothing good, nothing good is going to happen now. Now that that happened, now that that one didn't work, now that, now that they've walked out, now that the job, now that this, now that that, now that this, now, now it's not going to happen. And you can imagine, you can imagine the disappointment on those, on those followers of Christ, those women walking that morning in the early daylight of all that could have been if it had just worked out, if it, if it, if it would have just, it, if he just didn't let him kill him. If, if he had, if he had just, man, we, we could have went somewhere else. The disciples are back at the house. They're not even, you're going to find out they don't even believe the women when they come back. Their reasons he buys is so bad. They won't even believe the women they've been traveling with. Can I say this to you this morning? Some of you walked in here with recency bias so bad that you haven't had hope in so long that you can't remember. Because your circumstance has dictated your outlook on life. This relationship didn't work, so that one's not going to work. This kid didn't work, so when they become an adult, they're not going to work. This job didn't work, so I'm useless to even go look for another job. This one didn't work. That one. This one. Now that one won't, this one didn't, so that one won't. And you've been playing ping pong with your life. It didn't work, so it can't work. It didn't work, so it can't work. It didn't work, so it can't work. And so the most recent thing that's happened to you has affected your expectation of life. And you have, you, you've been without hope so long, you're afraid to even turn around and see if there's any available. It's just almost not worth it. It's almost not worth it to even try anymore because every time I turn around, every time, come on, you might have said that, right? Every time I turn around, something else bad happens. The disciples, the women, they were all had a bad case of recency bias and it wasn't turning out well. When they get back, after this thing happens at the tomb, they run back to the disciples and we find the disciples, like I said, in the same recency bias. Verse 10 of Luke. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the Mary mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. Now I'm going to say something here. I find it, I find it, pretty curious that the first people God in all of his sovereign wisdom and his plan, the first people he has go to the tomb that morning is women. And in that culture, women weren't trusted as much as men. Let's just be honest about it. So their recency bias, the men were sitting here, the women see the empty tomb, have an encounter with angels. They go back to the men and they say, he is not there. He is risen. We saw two angels dressed up like Liberace and they proved it to us. Anybody under 25 just went, Libba, what? <laughs> and the men went, stop lying to us. We watched him die. There's no chance. Luke records it being called, he calls it an idle tale. How could you, how could you go to the tomb and come back and make something up like that? Some of you found yourself in that circumstance where the last thing that happened was so bad, you won't believe anybody in the future. They could be people you've lived with for the last 10 years. They could be people that you've been married to people, a person you've been married to. They could be your own kids. They could be, they could be, they could be people you've worked with and trusted. They could be people who've taken care of you. They could be, because it was bad. Now they're coming to you and you go, nope, not going to believe it. What benefit did the women have that morning making something up? But yet they were so traumatized from what had just recently happened that their expectation was, there's no chance what you're telling me can be true. They had lost all hope. 
They didn't even, they didn't even want to try to hope. So they say, no, you're making it up. There's no hope in this. There's no chance for this to be true. You're making it up. But I need to let you know something. If you don't walk away with anything else this morning, I need you to know this. The tragedy and pain and difficulty can reside in the same house as hope. They're not incongruent. They're not, they're not, they're not separate. They, they, they're not like magnets that, are, that flipped around oppose each other. Difficulty and hope can live in the same house. Amen? It can live in the same house. And so that's when over and over again, Paul will tell us, man, the, these light and momentary sufferings are not, are not worthy to be compared with what he is doing in us. That, that, that this tragedy of life that we're living in has no bearing on the hope that he's giving us. Amen? If that was true, you'd stop raising kids at like two years old. No hope. They're two years old, they're still pooping their pants. Because the most recent thing they did was poop their pants. It's going to happen again. I know, it's going to happen again. Just don't even change it. That'll teach them. Let them live in it. We don't apply that to us. Aren't you thankful God doesn't treat us that way? Because you can't see a way out. He doesn't make you live in it. Our expectation has been broken, shattered. Maybe it was the job. Maybe it was the marriage. Maybe it has been kids. Maybe it, the expectation has been shattered. And, and the response is, it can't work. But the truth of the matter is, our lives are this, our lives aren't that simple. It's more complicated than that. It's the combination of difficulty and hope that, that makes us, it's, it's the thing, when we're created in the image of God, it's the thing that allows us to be that way. Jesus was hopeful on the cross. He tells the thief, you, today you will be with me in paradise. He doesn't say, we're all bleeding to death, there's no hope here. He's teaching us how to be in pain and hopeful at the same time. Just because the last thing that happened was bad doesn't mean the next thing that happened won't be good. Just because death was the last thing doesn't mean resurrection won't be the next thing. But what happens if we're not careful is we start looking in places where you will never find life. We start looking in places where there's no hope. So now the, now the words that the angels say to the women are starting to become a little clearer that there is hope out there. Matter of fact, Paul teaches us this over and over in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. There's three things that are taking place there all at the same time, praying, tribulation, and hope. They're not mutually exclusive. They're all happening. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. They're not one after another. They're all at the same time. If you're going through something difficult, be patient, pray and have hope because the last thing that happened to you doesn't signify the next thing that could happen to you. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Would you show up to Easter expecting? For your family, for your life, for your future, for your kids, Maybe you're graduating from high school. Maybe you're graduating from college. Maybe the future looks bright. Maybe, maybe you're starting a new career. Maybe you're figuring out what to do after a divorce. Maybe you're considering getting a divorce. Maybe, maybe you got a prodigal kid that you can't figure out how to turn back around. All these things happen in the same time. 
And scripture tells us to have hope. There was an old hymn when I was growing up. I mean, it's still around. Anybody, anybody remember the one that said, um, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. In every high and stormy gale, in every difficulty in life, the anchor to Christ holds strong. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. In the midst of difficulty in your life, when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. There is no recency bias in this hymn. There's no, get ready, bad things are coming. It's when the bad things are happening, he is my hope. When the bad thing's happening, my future is still bright. When the bad thing's happening, he can work it out. When I'm sick, he can heal. When I'm depressed, he can deliver. When I'm addicted, he can set me free. Amen? It is the message of the church. Here's the problem. Your expectations can determine where you look. Yeah. So watch what the women do. They expected Jesus to be dead, so they went to the tomb. Seems logical, doesn't it? It seems logical that your expectations would lead you on the scavenger hunt. So here's how it works. This relationship didn't work Long term, so we'll try the one night stand. This job didn't work, so I'll quit. Just do this one. Um, this didn't work, so I'll just search over here. And this didn't work, so I'll search over here. This didn't work, so I'll search over here. I'll search over here. And um, man, for the for the sake of being corny, uh, I did it first service. I, I got to do it again. Um, <laughs> We're, we're looking for love and, um, I warned you, I warned you up front. You know what, you know what Paul gives us the description of Galatians five chapter, chapter five, verse 19. He says this, now the works of the flesh are evident. The works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul in Galatians 5 is talking about the fruits of the spirit, but also the fruit of sin. This is the work of the flesh. Now you say, why'd you read that? That has nothing to do with the story. Lean in for a second. He's describing where our culture has been searching because our expectation that is everything's broken, nothing's going to work and it's all pointless. And the farther we get away from hope, the more we search under these rocks, the more we search under these things, the more we search under, well, I didn't get the opportunity. So I'm just going to be jealous and strifeful towards the person that did. I didn't get this. So I'm going to do this. And, and, and Paul's writing in Galatians five, an actual description of what it, of what the scavenger hunt of sin looks like. When your expectation is there is no hope, you start digging under those same rocks. Was no, what's the point? What's the point? Well, I'll pick up. I pick up the sexual addiction rock. It doesn't matter. There's no hope. I pick up the drug addiction rock. See if I can just numb the thing. It's no hope. What's it matter? Your expectation that there is no hope drives you into that thing. And we keep looking and looking and looking and looking. And before you know it, we've dug so deep that we can't even get out. So the angels look at the women who show up at the tomb and, he, and they say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And I think the heart of God is saying that to us as a church, as a culture, as a nation. Why do you keep trying to live and searching for that among the dead things? 
There is no life in addiction. There isn't. There is no life in switching from one relationship to another. There is no life in envy. There is no life in strife. There is no life in dissension. There is no life in all those things. Paul says, you will not inherit eternal life. Death is the result. And yet we have a recency bias. Oh, that bad thing happened. God doesn't like me anymore. God hates my guts. He let that bad thing happen. So the response to that then is just to go deep down into the pit of sin and go, we'll try another one. And all the while, the angel's voice is still ring true. Why do you keep looking there? Why do you keep looking there? There's nothing to be found. Now, listen, this is not like a game of hide and seek with kids. It's not. Because I like sitting on the sideline watching kids run around not being able to find each other. I think it's funny. <laughs> and you may think it's inconsiderate, but I like it when they pick on the littlest one. <laughs> it's very entertaining. The, the game lasts a really long time. So you've all seen it. A couple 12, 13 year olds get together who can manipulate a little bit. You know what I'm saying? They've had a little practice and they pick the four year old, count to 7,000 and come look for us, chump. <laughs> and then they go hide and then you sit back and watch the four year old just like, <laughs> not there, not there, not four hours later, not there, not there. We've been playing like a four-year-old. You know what I found out? You can't pull that over on a 20-year-old. First of all, they won't count to 7,000. They're like, forget you. And they already know all the hiding spots. How long are we gonna let, are we gonna be duped? How long are we gonna run around searching in places that we will never find hope? How long will we run around and get disappointed and disappointed and disappointed? And by the way, we become our own self-fulfilling prophecy. Because when you say there is no hope and that expectation causes you actually to look in a place where there's no hope, guess what you will find in that place? No hope. So we end up doing it over and over and over again, constantly. And that's why we bounce around from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's never satisfying. It's never satisfying. And all the time, why are you looking there? Why are you looking there? There's nobody here. There's no hope here. Don't look here anymore. Don't look here. If I could get everybody in the building just to, just to get out a sheet of paper and start writing down the places where you already know there's no hope, I'm not going to look there anymore. No hope. I'm, I'm gonna write that place down. No hope. No hope in that drug. No hope in that. No hope in that one. No hope in that one. No hope in that one. I ain't going back. Already searched there. No hope. Why do you keep looking there? Why do you keep looking there? Now listen. Something really neat happens here. The angels say to the, to the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? And then their next statement is like a clarification statement if you didn't notice. Can you put that scripture back up there? Their next statement is like a clarification statement. They say, and I think it's like, I think the women gave them a look. Anybody been on the other end of a look? <laughs> Anybody been on the other end of a look? Then the women didn't have to say anything. They just went. <laughs> and this is why I think, because if they understood it, they wouldn't clarify it. There would be no need to clarify the statement if the women understood it first off, but it was a confusing statement. Can we all agree? It was a confusing statement. We showed here to find Jesus and put spices on him. And the first thing you say to us, why are you looking for the living among the dead? I kind of think Mary, like, is it uh, uh, really? Like we walked here in the dark carrying these spices. And that's the first thing you're going to say, showing up in your Liberace suit. It's the first thing you're going to tell us. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And I think they gave the angels a look and the angels went, we better explain ourselves. 
because their next statement is an explanation of the, of the first one. As they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the get, dead? Go to the next one. He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee. Go to the next one. That the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And the very next verse, and they remembered his words. There might be one or two people in here that ain't been to church in 10 years. You've had unmet expectations. You were wishing your life would turn out a certain way. And now you've been searching under rocks and you haven't found any hope. And you showed up this morning to a church called Hope, maybe in a last just effort to find hope. And all you needed was to be reminded of what you already knew. As soon as they said that to the women, Luke records them running back to tell the disciples. All of a sudden their expectation had changed because they remembered what he said. That's right. That's right. That's right. He, we, we, we forgot what the, what the crazy, with the craziness of the crucifixion, with the craziness of not knowing what's going on. We forgot that he said it was going to happen. We forgot that he kept telling us it was going to happen. He actually kept saying it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He had been teaching them that. Mark 8, 31 says the same thing. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the scribes would be killed and after three days rise again. All of a sudden they went, oh, yeah. Yeah, he told, he was teaching and yes, this is what he said was happening. And in that moment, because they remembered the promise of God, they changed their expectation from, no, this, this well, how can this, to, we better run and tell somebody. We better run and tell somebody. And so they run right back to the disciples and they say, hey, get up. He's risen. He's risen. Get up. He's risen. Get up. He's risen. And even after the disciples are like, stop making stuff up, you better get up. Church, I need you to remember a couple things. Because the Bible has made some promises. God himself has made some promises to you that in your circumstance right now would be worth remembering. Because you might've woke up this morning, you might've got drug here, you might've, you might, you might've just been thinking, man, it's gonna be just another Easter service, Jesus raised from the dead. But my life isn't matching what the guy on the stage is saying. It's a good thing that I don't have to make sure that it does. He does. He's the one that backs up his word. He's the one that puts the warranty on it and the guarantee on it. He's the one that if he says it will happen, that my expectations should then match up with what he said. Not what is happening, but the fact that he promised me it would happen. So because it's not necessarily happening right now, remember, doesn't mean that it won't ever happen. It means that in the middle of that, I might have to be praying and being patient with hope because he hasn't failed me yet, amen? And so all of a sudden we start looking at scripture like this. Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That there's not a soul in this room right now that if he has started it in you, that he won't complete it. He has you, he's with you, he's for you, and you can have hope this morning because it's his promise, not mine. You can have hope this morning because it's not about your circumstance. It's what he's able to do. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. Father, we thank you today all across the building. If your expectations have been looking for the wrong thing, if you've been digging in the wrong holes, you've been disappointed after disappointed, I'm asking you this morning to hook your future to him, hook your faith to him, hook the last 
amount of energy you have to him and let him show you where life is. Let him show where you, you where hope is. Let him show you where the future is. Let him guide your steps this morning, amen? Come on, just lift your hands today. Surrender that to him. He has your future in his hands today. Come on, lift your voice.